Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, April 3rd, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here are tonight's top stories. Tonight, the hypocrisy of the Iran agreement. Then, a victim of Cuba's internment camp speaks out. And is it entertainment or predictive programming? That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I got one that can see. Get in there and deal with them right now. Scanning. Zzz, control. Zzz, manipulate scientific data. Zzz, take over. Blast control. World government. The United States, together with our allies and partners, has reached a historic understanding with Iran, which, if fully implemented, will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. The Islamic Republic of Iran has been advancing its nuclear program for decades. Today, after many months of tough, principled diplomacy, we have achieved the framework for that deal. And it is a good deal. Well, just hours after President Obama trotted out to give that formal announcement, some cracks began to emerge in this preliminary negotiation. Now, the United States, they immediately insisted in public statements and a fact sheet that they released that the sanctions on the country would be suspended or phased out over time after a final deal is inked. And they said they'd also be leaving in place any possible punishing actions if Iran were to renege on the deal. But just a few hours after that, Iran's foreign minister, who was the country's chief representative at these talks, suggested on Twitter that that's not what he agreed to. And he kept tweeting things out like the sanctions are to be terminated without delay. We would see these sanctions lifted immediately. Now, when asked about this, the State Department spokesperson Marie Harf said, Oh, well, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what the, their misrepresentation are that they're telling to their citizens. Uh, she said she doesn't know what Iran might have claimed in their own fact sheet because she doesn't speak Farsi, which is obviously the native language there in Iran. I don't speak Farsi either, but I can read those tweets, which are right there in English. Uh, this is what he is immediately saying, countering the claims made by President Obama. Um, and she also went on to say, that she was not really concerned about how the country would sell the plan to its citizens. So should we be concerned about how our president is selling the plan to its, this nation's citizens? Now, basically, who is telling the truth about this deal? It seemed to have popped up out of nowhere. It's a, an about face was made practically overnight about making these uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran. Now, Phyllis Bennis says that forces aligned in opposition to this Iranian agreement uh, in Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Israel would rather see war than see uh, Iran brought out of sanctions and back into play as a regional power. What is threatened by an agreement like this is not the possibility of, of an Iranian nuclear weapon. All 16 of the U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies agree that Iran has not even made the decision to try to build a nuclear weapon, let alone have the ability to do so right away. But it's the fear that, number one, it challenges Israel's nuclear hegemony in the region. Israel right now is the only nuclear weapons country in the region. So Israel is obviously voicing their opinion that this is a move toward giving Iran nuclear weapons, and obviously we know the implications of what that could have for the region. But this is also signaling a shift away from the really tight relationship that the United States has had with Israel for more than half of a century. We've almost guaranteed to always be uh, their ally and support them. Now, Kurt Nimmo points out the hypocrisy behind this Iranian nuclear agreement. The Obama administration admits that Iran is not developing nuclear weapons, but despite that reality, the U.S. and Israel continue to insist that this third world nation is a threat. But the U.S. and Israel are more of a threat than Iran. Now, this is basically what Nimmo is saying. These threats by Netanyahu is really to make sure that Israel is the only nuclear power in the region, and they want to force the neighboring countries to accept them as a state, despite the way that Israel has treated and continues to treat Palestinians and its neighbors, in particular Lebanon, which... 
Uh, Israel has invaded on five different occasions. Now, Warren Moss notes that one wonders if the reasons why these big powers like to push Iran around so much is because of the fact that it has such a weak, weak military. Now, he writes that China is estimated to have about 250 nuclear warheads, yet there's no call to impose sanctions on that communist tyranny. And maybe it's because it also has a military of more than 2 million active and 2 million reserve personnel, uh, also armored fighting vehicles, aircraft, and naval vessels, of course. Iran, on the other hand, has not attacked another nation in over 500 years, even though it was attacked with the blessing of the United States by Saddam Hussein's Iraq and has suffered economic sanctions that have been imposed on it by the United States and Europe. And lastly, the United States is the only nation to have ever used nuclear weapons. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombings targeted civilians and killed nearly 130,000 of them. Now, Russia, China, the UK, France, India, Pakistan, and Israel all have nuclear weapons. So one really has to wonder what's going on there, but we're definitely, definitely witnessing a major power shift in the region. Um, and as Marie Harf herself pointed out, the State Department spokesperson, how are we supposed to believe the story that we're being sold about this agreement? Religious infighting in the Middle East has been tied to religious prophecies for centuries. Now, coming up, I'm going to report on this weekend's Blood Moon, which is the third in a Tetrad series that falls on another auspicious date. And many believe that it has ties to the shifts in political power that we are witnessing right now. Now, more concerned citizens are speaking up about this Jade Helm military exercise, this time footage of troops interning citizens in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, has caused a victim of Fidel Castro's roundup to speak out. This is in a letter to the editor of the Corvallis Gazette Times. Larry Daly remarks that he was shocked to see video out of Fort Lauderdale, which featured military and police training together to arrest citizens and take them to internment facilities. He says, it has been more than 55 years since 1961, and Castro ordered the roundup of suspected resistors in Cuba. According to some press reports, in excess of 200,000 were arrested during the Bay of Pigs. Now, he goes on to describe the experience that he and his sister suffered through, but he says his memories were stirred after reading about Jade Helm, which, of course, is a realistic military training exercise that will involve the Green Beret, Navy SEALs, the 82nd Airborne Division, and, of course, local law enforcement. And it's set to take place from July 15th through September 15th. And the big warning here is that during this exercise, troops will attempt to operate undetected amongst civilian populations to see if they can infiltrate without being noticed. And again, that's, that's what we're saying here. It's not that we're saying martial law is coming this summer, but we're saying every single American, not just those who've actually been through a government-ordered roundup, all Americans should be concerned when they see the military training in our cities, training there, rounding up citizens, working alongside local law enforcement, seeing if they can infiltrate civilian areas, uh, unrecognized, rounding up dissidents. As Joe Biggs has said, you train for how you're going to fight. Now, coming up next week, John Bowne is going to be giving us another in-depth report on a precursor to Jade Helm. This is called the Phoenix Program. And someone there said it's a, uh, central to Phoenix is the fact that it targeted citizens and not soldiers. Well, new details emerged today about just a handful of fighters from the Shabab militant group, how they were able to kill nearly 150 students in Kenya's worst terrorist attack since the 1998 bombing of the United States Embassy in Nairobi. They only had a few light weapons. Well, the students report that militants shouted, come out and live, stay inside if you want to die. Now, they report that many fell for this trick. They voluntarily left their dorm rooms and obeyed commands to lie down in neat rows, only to be shot in the back of the head. Now, the students say they were pretty surprised with all of this because the university had been warned 
that there was the possibility for terrorist attacks. And this campus was in an area that had been targeted uh, several times in the past by the Shabab militants, and there were only two security guards there on the campus. Yesterday, we brought you the news about a mass shooting, a campus shooting in Kenya. The terrorist group Al-Shabaab opened fire at Garissa University College and killed nearly 150 people. Fox News reported the men were going door to door asking people their religion, and if they answered they were a Christian, they shot them on the spot. The first responders engaged the terrorists but were flat out outgunned. Al-Shabaab is the same group that attacked a mall in Nairobi years ago, killing many innocent people. And now they're threatening attacks here on U.S. soil, threatening the Mall of America. DHS has investigated the group and found them to be no credible threat. And I hope they're right. But if they're wrong, I'm very happy that we live in a country where we have concealed carriers. He kept pulling the charging handle and hitting the side. The break in gunfire allowed Mealy to pull out his own gun. I saw someone in the back of the Charlotte move, and I knew that if I fired and missed, I could end up hitting them. So Mealy took cover inside a nearby store. I'm not beating myself up because I didn't shoot him, but I know that after he saw me, the, I think the last shot he fired was the one that he used on himself. The gunman was dead. And in the Clackamas shooting, the mere sight of armed opposition forced the gunman to turn the gun upon himself. I guess he didn't want to take the chance of being taken alive. And now we're all asking the same question, how do we combat these mass shootings? Well, the chief of Interpol has come out and said, well, maybe we should just arm the citizens. The people should be able to protect themselves. And I do agree. Now, am I trying to put a firearm in every dorm room in America? No. But if you're somebody of age, of sound mind and body, and you don't have any criminal proceedings, you know, I think you should be able to go out and purchase a gun to keep yourself safe. But not everybody agrees with this point of view, and there are now actually articles out debunking the effectiveness of armed citizens. I have some self-defense stories here, and for the purposes of this report, I restricted this to public people in public places and not private individuals in their homes. We'll start with this one. Back in 2012, two robbers enter an internet cafe, one's holding a, a bat, the other one has a pistol. He jumps up with his own pistol, shoots at the robbers, and chases them out like the rats that they are. You see, got scary and pretty pathetic. But he saved the day. Another story from Wisconsin. A gentleman pulls out his concealed carry and then shoots this guy once the coast is clear. Gas station clerk thwarted robbery, fired for violating company's no weapons policy. So this guy, he saved himself and the people in the store, but he lost his job, unfortunately. Another story out of Philadelphia. A barbershop patron shoots gunman dead. Armed robber, no match for pharmacist with a 45. And there are videos accompanying uh, most of these articles I'm showing you. We're just skipping them for the sake of time, but you're welcome to go back and look at them for yourself. Woman fends off would-be attackers with concealed gun. And this is a bank employee with a concealed carry shoot, would-be robber in the jaw. Another bank story, bank customer thwarts robbery after returning to car to grab gun. And we'll end with this one. India's first gun for women fares well among men, and this was in response to the Delhi gang rape of 2012, where the young lady was raped on the bus with an iron rod by several attackers, and now they have a gun specifically designed for the women. I think the gun is way overpriced, but I'm happy to see that the young ladies are carrying this nonetheless and are able to defend themselves. So to anybody who would say that having a firearm does not protect you in a public place, I would want to debunk that and just tell them to go look at this. There are several other examples. Like I said, you can see uh, videos of people in their home. There are way more <laughs> than I can pull up for either one of these cases, but keep this in mind as we go forward and hopefully we can diminish these gun-free zones and get rid of these soft targets. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens. Simply put, if you want the best at an extremely low price, this is it. Winter Sun is the result of our 
pursuit of the best source of vitamin D3. The research and development took over two years, but the result, as verified by independent laboratories, is the best vegan vitamin D3 product in the world. Read the facts at InfoWarsLife.com about Winter Sun Vitamin D3. Not only does vitamin D3 promote a healthy mood, but vitamin D supports our memory and brain function, something the globalists are targeting. Visit InfoWars.com today or call 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal immunity blend crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. There is an extra special and rare total lunar eclipse taking place this Saturday morning. It has some people worried for this Easter weekend. The blood moon is a rare celestial event, yet for the third time in less than a year, the moon will dip behind the Earth's shadow, appearing a deep coppery red for a few minutes, and this will transform the skies over North America, Asia, and Australia into a deep red color. Now there are several interesting things about this particular blood moon. While some eclipses can last an hour or more, this will be the shortest lunar eclipse of this century. It's also taking place the morning of Easter Vigil, which is traditionally observed as the period between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The eclipse also falls within the first night of Passover, which is observed by Jews worldwide beginning Friday at sunset. Now, according to NASA, the rare tetrad of four alignments in close proximity has only happened a handful of times in the last 2,000 years. The final blood moon eclipse of the tetrad series will take place September 28, 2015, which also happens to be a Jewish holiday. Many people believe that these lunar eclipses and their appearance on auspicious dates signals a world-changing event that's about to take place. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Joel 2, 31. Now, regardless if you believe in the blood moon prophecies or whether or not God created the sun, moon, and stars to be signs for mankind, we are witnessing a pivotal time in the Middle East. Current events seem to be moving us toward World War III. So whether or not these blood moons are warning us about nuclear war, it's safe to say that something pretty major is about to happen. Now there's something else about this Tetrad series that's pretty bizarre. It happens to fall in a Shemitah year. This is something that hasn't happened for 2,000 years. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn points out in his book, The Mystery of the Shemitah, that these years in the past have brought down economies, kingdoms, and nations that haven't followed God's will. A very major thing happened that escaped most people. The Shemitah began in in the autumn of of, of 2014, and what happened is within two weeks, well, actually within one week of it beginning, and remember the Shemitah can mean the fall, within one week, America was overtaken, Russia became the greatest nuclear power on Earth. It actually surpassed the first week of the Shemitah. The second week of the Shemitah came something even more major, and that is that the American age that began in the year 1871, when we became the strongest economic power on Earth, came to an end. America was dethroned as the Shemitah began. It is now China has taken the crown of America. Now I've warned for, since the Harbinger came out, I've warned that if we don't turn back to God, there is gonna be the crown that America has worn as the head of nations gonna be removed. We are seeing the beginning of that right now. 
And so we are watching actually when, when the, um, the same week that the Shemitah began, Wall Street went crazy for about a month. Now, the, the pattern of the, the last Shemitahs have been that often at the beginning of the Shemitah, you don't notice anything, but there are often foreshadows. Well, the major thing, if something's going to happen, the major period is going to be uh, coming up is at the, always at the end of the Shemitah as we approach September. That's the time of that wipeout. I'm not saying it has to happen, but I believe we need to be aware of it. And interesting, people who look, you know, look at signs, um, they're, one of the signs in the Bible of judgment is the darkening of the sun or an eclipse. Not that it always is, but it can be. On the day that we get to the wipeout day, Elul 29 of this Shemitah cycle, the sun's going to be darkened at that time. That The last time that happened was 1987 when the, the sun was darkened at, the, at Elul 29. It led into Black Monday, the worst day crash in world history. Um, I believe we are going to watch, if we don't turn back, if this nation keeps on going on its course, we're going to watch the fall of America or the shaking of America. And the American age that you and I and, every, and all our listeners have known since we were born is going to come to an end. You can witness this rare event for yourself. The action starts at 5.16 a.m. Central Standard Time on the morning of April 4th. The Earth's shadow will slowly move across the moon, covering it entirely just before 7 a.m. I know that's a little bit early on a Saturday, but it's going to be a breathtaking spectacle, and you're alive, so get up early and witness it. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. Well, here at a supermarket in Toledo, you can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano now available in our limited first run at infowarslife.com that's infowarslife.com or call 888-253-3139 well, it's 2015, and science fiction has become science fact. Things that were predicted in movies like The Terminator or Minority Report or even 1984 are now coming to fruition. Do we really have such little control over our reality? Were we being programmed for this dystopic future all along? Or do we really have such little humanity left in us that we're willingly giving it away to our robot overlords? Well, my guest today, John Rappaport of nomorefakenews.com says, no, it's not all predictive programming, but our controllers just don't want us to know that we still have the power to create the reality that we desire. So John, thank you so much for joining the show today. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of your recent articles, Not Everything is Predictive Programming. We are always seeing these, these movies with their dystopic futures and with the robocops and pre-crime, and yet 
still every single day people are lining up to get the new biometric cell phone and something you know something that's going to enslave them with with all of this futuristic type stuff and so it's kind of hard to say well it, that those type of movies and science fiction and stuff aren't preparing us for this future when it seems that that's exactly what we're being corralled into so talk to me about everything not being specifically predictive programming well certainly a lot is let's get that straight um movies in hollywood nature blockbusters science fiction that sort of thing we certainly do see programming that are pre that is preparing people for a mechanized robotic mind controlled uh, horrific future and they turn these blockbusters out all the time and one of the reasons they do that is because they make money some of them make gigantic amounts of money. But you can go overboard with that to the point where you could say everything that's ever been done in the field of science fiction is predictive programming because it postulates futures, alternative futures. And that's the upside. Because if you're awake and alert and you're reading science fiction novels or seeing some science fiction, it stimulates your own imagination so that in the end, you begin to consider different possibilities for yourself and everybody else. Futures that can be created that don't exist now, that we're not locked into. That was the original purpose of science fiction. That was the whole idea, that it could forestall certain horrific futures and open up people's minds to the possibility of inventing futures that would be much better for all of us. But you see, if people don't even know they have imaginations, because in their schooling, training, indoctrination, and so forth, they've been basically taught to devalue it, to say, well, it's just a toy for children, and now I'm grown up, and now I have to do other things, then everything, and I can't stress this too much, then everything they take in from the world has a component of mind control in it because they are passive. They don't access their own imagination. A person with an active imagination can look at any number of predictive programming, movies, TV series, and so forth, and not be affected by that at all because they understand this is a product of somebody's imagination. Well, I have imagination too. And I can envision all kinds of other things. You see, that's part of what is creating this robotic society in the first place, is the fact that so many people don't seem to understand that they have a very powerful imagination that can conceive of futures for the human race, multiple futures, and their own personal futures for themselves, mm -hmm. what they would really like to be doing, like to be uh, exploring. That's a big problem in society, a gigantic problem. Yeah, absolutely. Especially since so many people from a very young age now are constantly tapped into technology. And I had a discussion with someone that they said, you know, they thought video games and things like that really helped to spur people's imagination and help them conceive these alternate realities, which is you know, something that you also mentioned science fiction is able to do. But at the same time, they're not really using their own imagination. They're just sub submerging themselves in this reality that someone has created for them. And so they're not actually getting out there and allowing them their minds to wander. And children or those that aren't awake don't realize that they are being subjected to a little bit of programming. So they might not even realize that they're not actually using their imagination, but they're being programmed. So talk to me a little bit about how, you know, if you aren't aware of that, how are some ways that they can sort of bypass your brain functions to sell you this reality? Visual images are very powerful. You know, kids become obsessed with these video games. Mm -hmm. That's a clue. That's called a clue. You know, when you're playing a game five, six hours a day, something is happening there that is entraining your mind, your brain, to operate along certain rhythms, 
with certain directions, narrow directions, intensely focused on, as you say, what somebody else is creating for you. It's the same in the political sphere or in the sphere of a major media. If you watch the news every night and you're not aware that you have any creative power of your own or imagination of your own, then everything you take in becomes programming. The voice of the anchor, the material that they're feeding you, the lies, the omissions, the lack of context, the whole ball of wax becomes nothing more than programming. Your life, <laughs> you know, your existence, the world, are all elements of mind control and programming for people who are not cognizant of the fact that they have creative power of their own. Right. That's, a, that's the bottom line on this. And so it becomes imperative for people to wake up and understand that, hey, I can invent things myself without any input from anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that you mentioned in one of your articles. I, I bring this up a lot uh, just in general speaking with people, but everything that we think is reality was at one time just in someone's mind. Someone thought, you know, hey, I'd like to be able to sit down without falling on the ground, and they visualized a chair, and then eventually that chair was manifested, and now there's chairs everywhere, there's buildings everywhere. Um, so you, I think you mentioned in your article, it's just sort of a, uh, we all agree, it's, some, it's a reality, it's manifested, we, we agree on it, uh, we agree that it's there, and it doesn't necessarily have to be what is real, but people don't even understand that they have the power to create something entirely new. I mean, it's not a good thing that people are spending five, 10, 15 hours a day in a virtual, a virtual world. There isn't a problem with that. If your world is so bad that you've gotta be tapped into a video game or something, that's not right. And I think that that's um, probably one of the big issues here with controlling people is they want people to be in this virtual world because then they can't ever manifest uh, something brand new. They can't ever change the reality that's being built up around them because there are a lot of people that are really invested in keeping this reality that they've worked so hard on for centuries real. And then if we don't ever realize our own power to be able to change that reality. Um, so, and the, speaking of that, I know I sent you this article as well, the Daily Mail. We know Facebook and, and Google and these, they're very <laughs> intrusive in our lives. But here they're working on uh, saying virtual reality done right can be observed as reality. And they talk a lot about how, you know, these are just optical illusions and our, we, they can trick our brain and how neat this is. And they're doing all this investigating. But Facebook, we already know their whole mission is to make it so th they want to be the portal into the Internet so that you never have to leave Facebook. And now they're talking about creating a virtual reality so that you never have to leave this virtual reality. And my goodness, I've seen a lot of science fiction movies that are just like this. So is this what's happening? And I mean, what do you think about this? It's horrendous. And it's exactly as you say. But, you know, optical illusions are very old. When I was a kid, I used to have a book of black and white op uh, optical illusions. And they would say, look at this picture, and you see this line is curved, right? No, it isn't. It's straight. So from that, they infer, look, we can give you a certain amount of limited visual data, and your brain will supply the rest. And we can predict what your brain is going to supply. So we can present you with cues and triggers and partial amounts of data, and you will fill in the rest. And that's true. On an automatic basis, that's what happens. And Facebook is very interested in that because, as you say, they want people to consider that Facebook is the Internet and they want to keep you there. In fact, they're now negotiating with media giants to present content on Facebook from, say, the New York Times, where you don't click a link and go to the Times. The Times displays some of its content right there on Facebook. So you are there all the time. But what they're basically trying to do is trigger automatic reflexes. And again, this works with people 
who have no consci uh, consciousness of the fact that they have their own creative imaginations. Because if they don't, then they just are passive receptors and they take in everything that is presented to them. This is ideal for the controllers of societies. This is what they want. That's why curriculum in the schools has never been tuned to the idea of imagination. Mm -hmm. That's why colleges never get involved with that subject as, in a serious way in order to stimulate the imagination of students. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want people running around who can look at reality and say, well, that's all well and good, but you see, I my goal is to invent something else, mm -hmm. something different. So, you know, in a population of 300 million people, if all of a sudden you had, I don't know, 75,000 people who were actively inventing other realities, much more interesting realities, and I don't mean mind-controlled realities, but different paths that individuals could take that would make them more powerful, more perceptive, more alive, and so on, more creative. Then we would begin to have a kind of open society, not the lockdown society that we have now. And then people would desert the news, uh, mainstream news, in even greater numbers than they are now. They would desert video games. They would desert the, the theaters, the movie theaters would largely empty out, except for what is real art. Because people would say, well, you know, I don't have to go to a museum all the time, I'm using that metaphorically, to see painting. I can paint myself. Mm -hmm. Now the worm turns. Now the seesaw goes the other way. Now you have people who are taking a creative stance towards reality and saying, yes, everything we see around us was once imagination. Well, that's what I've got, too. Mm -hmm. So I can invent things that are not here now. And mostly I can invent my own future that isn't here now. I don't have to take my cues from somebody else or some official source or from the government or from mega corporations or from video game manufacturers. I don't have to do any of that because I'm free of that because I know that I have the capacity to invent something different. And by the way, when that revelation comes, people do not live in fear anymore. Fear is not their main emotion. Fear comes when you feel trapped, when you feel there's nothing that can be done. You feel we're, we've lost. There's nowhere to go. The, you know, the major players have taken over and we're just spinning wheels until we become complete slaves. The fear of all that goes away. Right. And that's a fantastic thing. And fear as a vibrational energy doesn't go very far. It keeps you locked in. It keeps you right where you are. You're sort of paralyzed. And that's why people, when they see fearful messages on the news and everything, they're just locked into whatever the news is telling them, rather than just turning it off and going outside and looking and seeing that it's actually a really lovely day outside. And maybe you could actually do something about this perpetual state of war that the government seems to be continually dragging us into. and. Now, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about something some people can do. Now, I know that uh, in Davos, they just had the Davos Forum there in Switzerland, and one of the big sold-out events that was there um, was a, a daily meditation practice. So here we have all of these powerful people just packing themselves into this room uh, where they're being taught how to just sit silently for 10 minutes to visualize. And this is what they're being told is that that's what's going to give them a leg up against their competition. Uh, we, we hear a lot about athletes doing this, just really visualizing, you know, winning the, the game and all of that, of really going through the whole process of it and visualizing themselves winning. Uh, so this is something that obviously they know there's so much power of the imagination to really be able to create a reality. And here they're teaching that. But like you said, that's not really being taught in the schools. That's not being taught. Uh, to children or even to adults who have lost lost the sense of magic and knowing that they can create a better reality for themselves. So t 
talk to me a little bit about, you know what, I'm just going to give you the floor. I'm going to let you close out the segment and you can answer that question. And then if you have any sort of imagination exercises that you uh, can share with the audience, John Rappaport, nomorefakenews.com. Okay. Well, what you say is very true. If you can see something before it happens, something that you're going to do, but not just see it, actually play it out, a scenario, not just once, but a number of times, things can change. For example, it's exercise to somebody. He said to me, okay, I'm getting married and there's going to be a dinner before the wedding. You know, just a kind of prosaic sort of thing. And he said, the idea of this dinner, the families, everybody sitting around, just induces panic in me. So I want to be able to do something about it. And I said, okay, so try this. You sit there, you know, wherever you are, and you play out the scene. You're walking into the restaurant. You see your fiance, you walk up, you give her a kiss, you're introduced to her family. They meet your family. You sit down, you begin to eat dinner. Conversation flows back and forth. The dinner is over. You stand up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you finally leave the dinner. Play that scenario out all the way. And then when you're done, do it again. And when you're done, do it again. And you will notice that certain things come up little moments where, oh, I don't know about this one, I'm not sure. Make those moments work in your imagination the way you want them to work. Keep on inventing that scenario of the wedding dinner until it seems, you know, fairly ordinary and doable. And that's exactly what he did. And he came back to me later, he said it was a piece of cake. Because he had previewed it in detail, a number of times. And as he put it, he sort of worked out the wrinkles by changing what could have been a fearful moment into something that worked. Very simple thing. It works. It's doable. Here's something that's even wilder and more, I think, fun. Make a list work on this maybe 10, 15 minutes a day. At the top of the page or at the top of the screen in a file or whatever, put down things I would never want to do in my life. And be as, you know, prosaic or wild and, uh, you know, extreme as you want to be. Just write a list. And in some cases, instead of just a little item, you might say, oh, I'll write a paragraph about that crazy thing that I would never want to do. You know, I would never want to go to the moon in my underwear. And you begin to think, well, this is ridiculous, but just keep on going. Things I would never want to do in my life. If you do this for maybe a month or two every day for about 15 or 20 minutes, you might be surprised that suddenly out of the hopper, spontaneously, arises an idea and you say, well, wait a minute, maybe that is actually something I would want to do in my life. At that point, stop and write about that. I've had a number of people, and I've developed hundreds of imagination exercises for people, who have come to what they really want to create in the future in, with just that little exercise. All of a sudden, boom, it hits them. Wow. At that moment, the person suddenly realizes that this is not something I would ever want to do. Wait a minute. No, this might be something that I truly want to do. And I can see myself doing it. In fact, this could become my entire future, a major fantastic future where I create what I truly want to create, not only for myself, but for other people as well. It revolutionizes their life, and it all starts with this simple act of imagination and doing this exercise. This is the power of imagination. This is what people forget in their lives. And when they remember it, they experience enormous 
amounts of energies that have been repressed and shunted and buried, and they come back to themselves in full flower. That's a revolutionary change at the individual level, at the political level, economic level, at all levels for people. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. It's a very simple, simple exercises, but so powerful. And that's what people need to realize is that it is time to break free of the programming. And it's as simple as just reprogramming your own thoughts and seeing the world the way you would like to see them, believing what it is that you think is real and not what people is just telling you. This is this is the reality you live in, period. You can never change, change it. So thank you so much, John, for joining us. Always good to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, that's it for the show tonight. Be sure to hit the subscribe button, and you can also become a subscriber to prisonplanet.tv, where you can share your username and password with up to 20 people at the same time. Thanks for tuning in tonight. We'll see you here Monday, 7 p.m. Central. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.